Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear differences and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, to whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, our Defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair, deliver your sons and daughters from fear, and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading, 1 Kings. On Mount Horeb, where God had appeared to Moses with typical signs of God's presence, earthquake, wind, and fire, Elijah now experienced God in sheer silence. God assured Elijah that he is not the only faithful believer. 7,000 Israelites are still loyal. God instructed Elijah to anoint two men as kings and to anoint Elijah as his own successor. A reading from 1 Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down, down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mihola, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Your faithful people and 
to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Matthew's Gospel typically portrays Jesus' disciples as people of little faith who fail despite their best intentions. In this story, Matthew shows how Jesus comes to the disciples when they are in trouble and sustains them in their time of fear and doubt. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'm guessing that you've had experiences like this. On one particular day, your life is generally positive and all of your experiences is very productive. You should, of course, end that day feeling quite good about yourself. But in the midst of all those affirming parts of your day, there occurs one very negative moment. It might have been an argument with someone from work or from home. It might have been a negative encounter with a complete stranger. But if that negative experience was emotionally charged, and I'm going to guess that by the end of the day, it was a spoiler for all the good that had come your way. We are programmed from our earliest beginnings to be extra alert for that which threatens us. Any challenge to our well-being sticks and it needs to be processed for what we might learn. In other words, 
The negative and the painful don't go away by themselves, especially if we just try to ignore them. Which is why a significant loss in your life requires a period of grieving. Any public failure, whether at work or with family, must be a place for learning. And on that level, the saying is actually true. Whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. With that, I want to remind you of the context for today's gospel lesson, especially if you've been tracking the homilies at Trinity these past few weeks. You already know that I switched up two weeks of our lectionary in order to have a specific set of lessons for last Sunday's confirmation service. So we have not been reading Matthew in order. So allow me to reset the scene. First, <clears throat> First, Jesus receives the troubling news of the violent and the very gruesome death of John the Baptist, his cousin and the one who heralded his mission. And on hearing that, Jesus departed by boat to get away from the crowds and to find a quiet place in which he might presumably grieve for John. The crowd, however, tracked his progress from the land and when he came ashore, they were waiting for him with many who were sick and ailing. And Matthew said, Jesus had compassion on them. And he spent the rest of that day ministering to all who were sick. No quiet or alone time for him. At the end of the day, the disciples urged him to send the crowds away so that they could return to the towns to buy something to eat while it was still daylight. But instead, Jesus instructs the disciples to give them something to eat, even though they only had a small snack among themselves. <clears throat> the crowd at the feeding miracle, which followed, was listed as 5,000 men plus the women and the children. Certainly a high point for all involved in the ministry of Jesus. <clears throat> now, when the supper was over, Jesus sent his disciples away. Then he himself dismissed the crowds and finally found himself alone and able to pray, to grieve, and to process his own feelings. And that brings us to today's text. The disciples were caught in a quick and a dangerous storm, the kind that can blow up without warning on Lake Erie. They fought against the pounding waves and the wind, <clears throat> which the New Revised Standard Version says was against them. But a more literal translation could be that the wind was hostile to them like an enemy, or perhaps even the wind was terrorizing them. It was a dicey situation. And Jesus, having prayed, comes to them walking on the water. And this, which is far more difficult to understand than a violent storm, completely terrorized the disciples. And they are crying out, presumably hysterically. And Jesus says, and again, to offer a more literal translation of the Greek, he says, be brave. I am. Do not fear. Now, the important part of that for you today to hear is I am. That is a reminder to anyone familiar with the Hebrew Bible that of that name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush, the name which became for the children of Abraham the most sacred name of God, the name they so revered that they would not even voice it aloud lest they somehow dishonor it, the name that is translated into English from the Hebrew as I am. Now, it's one thing to have a negative encounter in an otherwise good day, it's even one thing to have an essentially bad day all around. We have been having a bad year by almost any measure. 
the novel coronavirus is so wildly present in our society that we, and there are no bragging rights here, lead the world in infections and deaths. The economy, in spite of the trillions of dollars poured directly into it via the stimulus packages of the spring, or the additional trillions deployed by the Federal Reserve Board, the economy remains greatly at risk. Millions are out of work. The stoppage of federal support for the unemployed and the expiration of the ban on evictions is a troubling double whammy that some are warning may tip us into the economic trough of a depression. As some iconic corporations in our country file for Chapter 11 protection under our bankruptcy laws, many, many more small businesses are beginning to close their door. It has been a bad year. Who could blame anyone for not feeling terrified? And I wonder how many of you have prayed like Peter, Lord, save me. The disciples seem to have forgotten all that had happened the day before. The multitude of healings topped off by the miracle of a meal for thousands from a small amount of bread and fish. Are human memories of God's power so short-lived as all of that? Peter too knew all that had happened the day before, and then he had just had the added invitation to join Jesus for a stroll on the stormy seas. He even walked some, but then he became just too distracted by the immediacy of danger, and he forgot who he was with. Following Peter's rescue from the stormy deep, Jesus climbed into the boat and the text says that the wind ceased. And then those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. The danger they faced, the terror of their predicament, it seems was necessary for their insight when Jesus declared, be brave. I am, do not fear. So often we want to see God on the good side of our lives and experiences. We want to see God in a rainbow, not in the danger of gale force winds. We want to see God in the joyful birth of a new child, not in the devastating diagnosis of a life-threatening illness. We want to see God in the dark, black ink on a year-end balance sheet, not in the disruption of an economic meltdown. Yet it is in those times of danger and need that faith is formed. It is in those moments when God seems most absent that trust becomes the light that enables us to perceive his presence. However, Disasters themselves are not a sign of God's activity. In our first lesson today, Elijah was also coming off a series of wins. He had defeated the prophets of Baal in a contest, and he had just announced the end of a drought. But when you thought he might be at his faithful best, he heard that an angry queen, Jezebel, had sent assassins to end his life. And so he fled to a lonely cave on a far away mountain. And there he encountered God. You heard the text. First, there came a dangerous and destructive wind. But God was not in that powerful display. And then there came a mountain topping earthquake. But God was not in that shaking. Third, a great fire ran up the side of the mountain. But God was not in the flames. Finally, there was silence. The rather obscure Hebrew is sometimes translated as the sound of sheer silence. 
in that which displayed the least power and was not awe-inspiring in any way. That is where Elijah encountered God. And Elijah, like Peter and the disciples, like you and me, have only one path to an encounter with God. And that is the path of trust and faith. If in powerful storms or destructive natural disasters, if in the abundance of good things like miracle banquets or healed bodies, we expect to find God, we may well be disappointed. For God comes to us when and where we least expect the encounter. And God comes to us with the same words spoken to the disciples in that tossing boat. Have courage. I am. God is with you. Don't be afraid. Let our faith find strength in that promise as faith moves us to worship and a deep reverence for God who loves us so much. And then having enjoyed that encounter, let us get busy and be light in the midst of our present darkness. Have courage. God is with you. Don't be afraid. Let us read the Apostles' Creed together. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For your whole church throughout the world, give courage in the midst of storms so that we see and hear Jesus calling, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. May we follow Christ wherever he leads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of your creation, protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Help the human family endeavor to sustain and be sustained by the resources of your hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations and their leaders, in you, steadfast love and faithfulness meet, and righteousness and peace kiss. May nations in conflict know the peace that is the fruit of justice and the justice that is the path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in need, everyone who calls upon your name will be saved. Accompany all who are lonely. Hear the voices of those who cry out in anguish and support those who are frustrated in their search for an affordable place to live. We pray for those suffering this day, for those homebound, Ray and Dorothy, Christine, Pat, Maybeth, Marilyn, Janine, Terry and Mary Lou, Joan, Marge, and other prayers go out to Christopher, Jennifer, Carol, Rosella, Linda, Jeanette, Sandy, Susan, for all who are facing coronavirus and for those receiving care from Stephen Ministries and those who we now name either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation, you have gathered us here today as your people and we thank you for this gift. We pray for those who are new to the community, for students and teachers preparing for a new school year, and for those struggling with unexpected hardship. Supply us generously with your grace for our life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your spirit be the guide as our call committee works to find the next pastor for Trinity. Support our Senate members our call committee members, and those pastors who we will eventually meet and consider for ministry among us. Let your love guide us and sustain us in this journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in the baptismal anniversaries of Ken Castle, Gunda Lahoff, Julie Krieger, and Bill Ferber. We thank you for the youth in this congregation and community, especially today for Susanna Holmes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for the saints of the whole church from all times and places, and for the saints in our lives and in our community whom you have gathered to yourself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
God of goodness and growth. All creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We welcome you to worship this morning. We're always glad when you can join us in our online offering, which is available beginning on Saturday evenings on our YouTube channel. We also meet outdoors on the church lawn or from your cars via our FM transmitter on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We congratulate our four young people who affirmed their baptismal covenant last week Congratulations, A.J., Eliza, Grayson, and Nathan. The FaceTime group meets on Tuesday at 1030 in the Picnic Pavilion on the church campus. Everyone is welcome. Bring your own chair, face mask, and coffee or tea. Our book study of How to Be an Anti-Racist will begin on Wednesday, August 19th. We'll meet in the evening over a Zoom to accommodate the greatest number of people. For the first step, you should purchase a copy of the book and read the introduction and chapters one and two. This book is available at local bookstores or from online sellers in paper or electronic versions. To make certain that you receive the sign-in details for the Zoom meeting, Register your interest in attending with Pastor Bishop at his email, prsbishop81 at gmail.com. You can also receive those, that information from the church office. Thank you, and may you have a most blessed week. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.